Even though it may not have seemed that way, so far we've only considered simple contagion. And by simple, I mean that if one of my friends is infected, that's enough for me to become infected as well. Of course, there are parameters, the probability per time period that my friend infects me, whether they'll recover before they have a chance to infect me, etc. But the main thing that makes it simple is that it's just between me and one of my friends. And this makes sense for things such as viruses that are diffusing or even information that's diffusing. It's enough for one person to tell me a piece of information and then I know it. On the other hand, there are other processes, for example, the adoption of certain behaviors or the, uh, the making of purchases, where you may want to consider what multiple of your friends are doing. So for example, say I'm an impressionable teenager in high school and I, I see one of my friends wearing red pants. I'm not going to run out and buy red pants just because one of my friends did. I want to make sure that several of my friends are wearing red pants before I'm really convinced that that's the cool thing to do. And then I'll go ahead and do it. And as you might imagine, this has rather different dynamics. So let's go back to that small world topology and see what that does. So here I am in NetLogo. I have um, created a slightly smaller network so we can better see what's going on. And what we're going to do is we're going to do this complex contagion process on top of the network where the rules are that a node will look around to its neighbors and it will adopt the behavior that is will become yellow if it decides to buy red pants and it will do so only if at least two of its friends have done this already. So um, to begin with, we're going to infect two neighboring nodes because unless we do this, the, the infection is kind of dead from the get-go. So no one's going to buy um, red pants if only one node in the network has bought red pants, according to these rules. And now we're going to allow um, this uh, you know, red pant craze to spread. I'm going to reinfect a few times just so you can see what's going on. And I'd like you to pay attention to both what is the structure like, where the infection is stopped, and also is the infection successfully using the short range ties, I mean, the, the long range ties. Um, so we can kind of let this run a little bit. And hopefully this is enough information, otherwise you're very welcome to play with the model yourself. So here is our question. Um, relative to the simple contagion process, the complex contagion process, is it better able to use shortcuts? Does it advance more rapidly through the network? And does it infect a greater number of nodes? Complex contagion, even though it has the name complex, has, in this case, it had a very simple rule. That is, it was a threshold model, and the threshold was just in terms of the number of your neighbors that have adopted a certain behavior. However, sometimes what you're really playing is a coordination game where you have two different choices and you're trying to decide between them. And as I said in the previous segment, this could be, for example, deciding between different chat online chat clients, and it depends on how many of your friends are using each of them. So it's not that two friends are using it, but are more friends using one versus the other? And also importantly, how good are those, those chat clients? So let's switch the context a bit and say, we're still choosing between two things, and let's just call them basketball and soccer. And if a friend chooses to play basketball as well, so they're making choice A, I will get payoff A every time for each friend. And if my friends choose B, then I will get payoff B. And um, if, you know, I just have one friend and they choose the opposite of what I chose, then my payoff is zero, right? I get no enjoyment if I want to play soccer and I can't play on my own and my friend only wants to play basketball. So let's see how this plays out. This node in the middle is trying to decide between playing basketball, which 
Three of his friends play basketball or playing soccer. Two of his friends play soccer, but that's not the only variable, right? So sure, three-fifths of his network is basketball and two-fifths of his network is soccer, but there's also the question of which one of these sports he enjoys more. So how is he going to do this, this calculation, deciding between the two sports? Well, this is the formulation. He has D neighbors or D friends and a fraction P of them are going to play basketball. This is the three-fifths and one minus P, P fraction of them are going to play soccer. This is the two-fifths. And if he chooses to play basketball, his payoff is the number of his friends who are playing basketball, which is just P times D, times a, which is the payoff he gets per each friend who plays basketball. Similarly for soccer, the payoff, if he, if he were to choose to play soccer, the payoff would be 1 minus P times D, that's the number of friends who are playing soccer, times B, the payoff he gets or the enjoyment he gets from playing soccer with each of them. So this means that he should choose A if P times D times A is greater than or equal to 1 minus P times D times B. These you know, payoff from soccer and payoff from basketball. And you can reformulate this so that it's, he will be playing basketball if the proportion of his friends playing basketball is greater than or equal to B, which is the payoff for soccer, divided by A plus B, kind of the sum of the payoffs for either choice. And there are two equilibria in this problem. The first is that everyone decides to play basketball. And what an equilibrium means is that no individual, given the current situation, would want to um, switch, right? Because if everyone's playing basketball, you would get zero payoff from playing soccer because you there are no other soccer players. So it's just not possible. You get payoff zero from each of your friends because they're all playing basketball. Um, similarly, everyone could decide to play soccer, in which case no single individual would choose to play basketball instead. But what happens in between, right? You have these equilibria, which is that everyone's just doing one thing. But what if for some reason you had two of the nodes switch. There could be some external um, reason. So let's see a particular example. Let's say that the payoff for playing basketball with a friend is three and the payoff for playing soccer with a friend is two. And we have the um, the payoff, that means that the payoff for nodes who are both playing basketball is three halves as large as what they get if they both choose to play soccer. So you get like a 50% you know, greater payoff. And this also means that nodes will switch from um, soccer to basketball if at least two-fifths of their friends are, uh, you know, not using A, are, are playing A, are playing basketball. So it means that you don't it can be a minority, it can be two-fifths of your friends who are playing so much more appealing than soccer that you will switch once you pass that threshold. So, let's see how this cascade might occur. Suppose you have some devious company that comes in and says, we'll give you free shoes, you know, named, branded with some basketball player's name, if you play basketball and you don't play soccer. And so these two nodes then start playing basketball. Now this node is looking and it's finding that half of its friends, so two out of four, are playing basketball. And since the threshold for switching over is two-fifths, now this uh, node as well is playing basketball. Now the quiz question is, can you figure out which node or nodes will switch to playing basketball next? Is it going to be just A, just B, just C, or some combination of these three? Okay, hopefully you figured out that it was B who would switch next because it was looking at its four neighbors, two of whom had switched, versus at that point, you know, if you, if you exclude B, um, a was looking at three neighbors, only one of which had 
um, switch to basketball. And so that's that's one third, which is less than, than two fifths. So it wasn't sufficient to flip either A or C was in a symmetric situation. But now that B has flipped, both A and C also find it favorable to switch to basketball. And so what you just saw was a cascade going through the network, even though it just started with two nodes changing their minds or having their minds change for them. And then everyone um, goes ahead and switches to basketball, which presumably is good because it seems like the payoff for basketball and this you know, fake scenario is higher than it is for soccer. There's a NetLogo app, which you will be exploring a little bit more in your assignment, um, that allows you to try different topologies. And what you'll be doing is allocating an initial opinion. Um, your nodes are going to be flipping a biased coin, deciding Actually, I think it's an unbiased coin, so 50-50, whether they're red or they're blue. And then you can um, update their opinion according to these rules and these payoffs. And you can try this several times just to see how the structure plays out as to what the stable configuration is. That is, no individual node would like to switch given their current payoffs. There are, of course, implications for viral marketing. If you really can influence some subset of the nodes, whether by paying them off or giving them um, free product samples, which individuals would you want to pick? And so um, using the same um, app, you can uh, kind of take turns if you find someone to play this with, otherwise you can kind of play against yourself if you like. So you can take turns selecting um, which nodes you initially infect and then you can see how the uh, what the payoff is as far as how many individuals eventually adopt your uh, product, whether it's red or, or blue. So you would select blue and say, I want to, well, now it's red's turn and red says, well, I want to be right here. And blue might pick here. Oh, sorry, we did another red, um, no matter. And here is blue. And now we can do successive updates and just see how things play out. In this case, um, or red did not choose very wisely. So the question is, you know, what is the stable uh, set of choices and how might you optimally select your initial set such um, that you would maximize your influence within a network? So having seen several of these demonstrations, let's see if you've built up enough intuition to answer the following. What is the role of communities in complex contagion? Do they enable ideas to spread in the presence of thresholds? Or do they create isolated pockets of nodes within the network that are impervious to outside ideas? Or do they allow different opinions to take hold in different parts of the network? Hopefully you've realized that they actually do all three. In the first case, complex contagion means that you need to observe multiple of your neighbors doing some action or that you're going to decide based on the fraction of your network that is doing one thing as opposed to the other. And for this, community structure is very crucial because it provides the dense linking around the ego, that is the node, that allows them to observe similar behavior among their friends. Similarly, though, it can create isolated pockets of nodes who are holding on to one opinion or one way of doing things because they're seeing that, well, most of their friends within the community are doing something one way and it would just be too inefficient or too costly to switch to something that someone is bringing in from the outside. So on the one hand, it facilitates adoption within the community, but it makes it hard for new things to come into the community in the first place. 
it also then consequently, consequently allows different opinions to take hold in different parts of the network because each community may independent, not independently, but they may, it may seem as if though they independently can hold on to their beliefs. One last wrinkle that I would like to introduce, and this you can read about in the Easley and Kleinberg chapter 19, is that of bilingual nodes. Now, what, are you, what are you talking about, Lotto? We haven't been talking about languages. Well, in this case, it might mean if you actually are uh, by sporty <laughs> that is you um, play basketball and you play soccer well that's great then you can play with everyone who plays basketball and with everyone who plays soccer however typically in these situations there's some cost so besides the actual cost of maybe needing a pair of cleats for soccer and a pair of basketball shoes for basketball perhaps the cost is your time. You simply have to spend more time um, playing both sports and you may not get as good as, you know, if you weren't splitting your time between the two activities. So in this case, being bilingual comes with a cost. Similarly, the earlier example of instant messaging clients, you know, just having the overhead of having two messaging clients open or setting up a single messaging client to talk with two different services and then you know having to manage your identity on two different clients as well can be a hassle right so there's some cost but you may very well be willing to pay that cost because it means that you can now interact with more parts of your network, even though they may have been making different decisions. So let's try this on the line. So switching back over to NetLogo, I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to turn off bilingual and I'm going to, well, is, this is what you might first see when you do set up line, but if you just lay out, you'll see that it's a nice ring lattice, in fact. And we can allocate the opinion at random and then we can update. So just observe what's going on. Let me allocate again, right? And so, um, great. So we have A is the payoff for playing blue. And in this case, the payoff for blue is higher than the payoff for red. Now I'm going to turn on bilingual, which means that a node can choose to uh, be able to interact with both red and blue. However, it will have to pay this additional cost of two. So I'm going to allocate the opinion and then I'm going to update. And you can see several bilingual nodes cropping up where they would like to talk to someone who's red and someone who's blue. And now we can keep updating. So let's just do that again. So we have initially nodes using red and blue. Now we update. So see if you can answer this quiz question, which is, what is the presence of the bilingual nodes do? Does it help the superior solution to spread throughout the network? Or does it help inferior options to persist in the network? Or does it cause everyone in the network to eventually become bilingual? What you could have concluded from the demonstration in NetLogo, let me maybe go back to it, is that these bilingual nodes are allowing the inferior solution, that is red, to persist versus when we didn't have bilingual nodes, um, everything turned blue eventually because it was it simply had the greater payoff. So bilingual nodes are good in that they bridge, but in the long run, they may keep the superior solution from really taking over in the network. One last type of complex contagion that we'll talk about, and that is collective action. So previously we talked about in complex contagion that you may wait for a couple of your friends to wear red pants and then on subsequent days you might start wearing red pants as well. However, in some situations you may want to coordinate ahead of time because that first person to 
show up to school in red pants may very well not have a very good time because people might ridicule them. Um, on the other hand, if three of your friends, all you and three of your friends all decide to show up to school in red pants, well, people can try and ridicule you, but you have strength in numbers and you can kind of um, hold together and, and be just fine. So another example of where this can crop up is in protests. If you go out and protest on your own, sure you might feel silly if you're the only one um, holding up a, a sign, but also if, for example, you're protesting in, uh, you know, against an oppressive regime, um, it may very well be dangerous. So there's strength in numbers. If you're one of many people protesting, then um, you're, uh, you know, it's less likely that you'll get in trouble. So you may want to coordinate with your friends. So just to sum up, you want to coordinate so that you don't end up uh, here being the lone protester and that instead you're with your friends and happily protesting. So. In general, though, different people might have different thresholds. So here is a node who would go and protest only if four people or more in total would go. So he would need three other friends to say, yes, we're going to go protest, and then he would be happy going and protesting. However, he only has two friends, which means that he doesn't even have a chance of doing a coordination among four. This node would go if three people in total would go. So he would go if this node and this node would go. However, we already know that this node would not go. Now this node in turn would go if just one other person went because its threshold is two, so it and a friend would happily go. But now this one isn't going because this one isn't going and so nobody goes and uh, you know no one goes out and protests. In this network, on the other hand, you would get partial turnout. This node doesn't have a chance. It wants to coordinate with three other people, but it only has one friend. So yeah, they're not going to go out. But these three nodes each have this threshold of three, and they're all talking to each other, and hence they'll all go and turn out. So see if you can answer this question about the network here. Um, and we're, what we're looking for is whether this network is going to uh, mobilize, whether at least a fraction of the nodes will protest.